Coming up, expert analysis on the biggest aviation story of the week, Boeing 737 MAX series airliners grounded. It skis, flies, and now it floats. It could be yours. The AOPA sweepstakes Super Cub is now amphibious and we'll take it for a splash. Plus, wind shear and what to do about it. AOPA Live this week begins in just a moment. There are many important things to consider before purchasing an aircraft. Let the experts at Aerospace Reports help guide you through the process. We combine expert knowledge with our long-standing commitment to personalized customer service to perfect your transaction. Learn more at aerospacereports.com. This is AOPA Live This Week with Tom Haynes and Melissa Rudinger. Two crashes of the same model of a brand new airliner within months have authorities around the world grounding the Boeing 737 MAX 8 and MAX 9. We're talking to experts to take a deep dive into the issue from a pilot's perspective. That's right, Melissa. You often hear pilots saying, if it ain't Boeing, I ain't going. Well, today there's a lot of 737 MAX pilots and passengers who ain't going anywhere. FAA grounded the new fleet of airplanes this week. The MAX uses the larger, more fuel-efficient GE LEAP engine, which extends further beyond the wing leading edge than other 737s and requires an increase in nose gear length. Those changes shift the center of gravity, and that ne necessitates some other changes. I turn to aviation expert and commentator Fred TC for some perspective on what that means. I ask him specifically about the MCAS, or Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, that is suspected in at least the Lion Air crash. You know, it's interesting. In order to compensate for what the engineers perceived to be an issue with respect to pitch, it added this MCAS system, which operates when the autopilot's off and the angle of attack is, exceeds certain limitations um, and the airplane's being banked pretty steeply. And and what it will do is, is it'll run the, st the stabilizer pitch uh, down and anywhere up to, I think it runs at like 0.28 degrees per second up to 2.8 degrees or nine seconds and then it reassesses and then it will start again until it believes the airplane's reached a safe angle of attack and it operates without the pilots knowing. So they added this system that goes on when the airplane is in a perceived issue with its with its pitch up and, and I've actually seen some, some literature that says that it's it takes into account the weight of the aircraft as mm -hmm. well. Right. And so that, they think that's what activated, at least in the Lion Air case, that confused the pilots. Correct, because what happens is, is that now the airplane's pitching down and actually moving the control yoke will not stop that system. There's a couple of ways to stop it. One of them, interestingly, um, is to manually turn the trim wheel. That will deactivate the MAX, the, the M MCAS right. system, which, which is fascinating to me because, you know, as you over the years as you move from bigger airplanes to bigger airplanes and my instructors always tell me don't trim the wheel manually use the switch which interestingly in the 737 max if you if the pilot uses the trim switch on the yoke the system will stop but in five seconds if it doesn't after that's happened if it doesn't believe the aircraft is properly in a, is in a proper attitude it'll reactivate right and so um what do you think of the FAA's decision this week to finally ground the U.S. fleet after pretty much the rest of the world already taken that action? Was, was it necessary? Well, yeah, it's interesting. If you ask the people who fly this airplane the most in the U.S., which is Southwest, their airline union said no. Um, I, for, I forgot where American comes out on it. But, you know, Tom, discretion is the better part of valor. So anyhow, a lot of news unfolding this week, obviously, about the 737 and, and what all that means. I've talked to several pilots who have flown it. They say it's, they're comfortable with it. They're just a little disappointed in the level of training materials that Boeing has supplied to the, to the pilots. Uh, but then the real question is now, what's next? How do you bring an airplane like that, the fleet, back online? What changes must occur? What sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the logbooks and, and all the training materials have to be updated, that sort of thing. If that all happens, you know, we could be months getting that taken It's care. a mess and, uh, t and tragic for th those that have lost their lives. But it, yeah. not being an expert, we'll leave it to the experts. But it sure sounds like some training could go a long right. way on uh, helping folks under that are flying right. these airplanes understand yeah. the systems. Absolutely. So. Well, something on something more fun. The time is near. Pretty soon, the AOPA Sweepstakes Super Cub will have a new home. The Sweepstakes ends May 31st. We followed the Super Cub throughout its full restoration, and now there's just one more finishing touch that makes the Super Cub the ultimate adventure machine. 
AOP's online managing editor, Alyssa Cobb, has the story. The metamorphosis is complete. AOPA's sweepstakes Super Cub that debuted as a backcountry beauty has taken on its final form as an amphibian that's equally at home on land as it is on water. The Whipline 2100 amphibious floats were installed by Whip Air in Leesburg, Florida. You get a lot more options with the amphibious floats. Drawback would be, of course, the extra weight of the gear itself. To offset the extra weight of the floats, Whip Air also donated its gross weight increase kit so the Super Cub will still have over 500 pounds of useful load. It took about a week to outfit the sweepstakes airplane. Much of the prep was done ahead of time by Baker Air Service when they restored the airplane. Everything seemed to match up really well. There was no, uh, no deviation of installation from somebody else doing it to her, doing it. Everything seemed to match up well. One of the special considerations with amphibious floats is making sure the landing gear is in the correct position before landing. To make sure the pilot is aware of the gear position, the Super Cub is equipped with Whip Air's laser gear advisory system. Laser system, it identifies water and ground, so it allows the, uh, the pilot, if he's in the wrong configuration, the uh, plane's going to tell him. With the airplane's transformation complete, it's time for the lucky winner to earn his or her sea legs with a seaplane rating. Promark Aviation in Texas is donating the training toward the rating. After all, the winner should be as comfortable on land and water as the Super Cub. Alyssa Cobb, AOPA Live. Want to know how the sweepstakes Super Cub flies on floats? AOPA president and Super Cub aficionado Mark Baker took it for a flight hear what he thinks about it in our show next week. And a chance for you to see your sweepstakes Super Cub in person. At the time we record this, we're just three weeks away from Sun and Fun. We hope you'll join us at Florida's Lakeland Linder Regional Airport for the week. AOP will have a large presence at the show, including the Super Cub. Be sure to stop by our tent to say hello. We'll be on hand to answer your questions, but hey, don't spend all your time with us. There are air shows every day, you know. U.S. Navy Blue Angels are the headliners this year. AOPA members get an exclusive discount on tickets to the event. Buy your tickets on our website, aopa.org slash save SNF19. While you're making plans for your flying year, we hope you'll include one of AOPA's fly-ins. We have three great events for you. We'll kick it off on May 10th and 11th right here in Frederick, Maryland. Then we head to Livermore, California. Join us in wine country June 21st and 22nd. We'll cap off the year with Southern Hospitality down in Tullahoma, Tennessee, September 13th and 14th. There's a lot of great programming, including a Stoll Invitational, and you won't want to miss it, so make your plans now. And a note about one of the fastest growing aviation events. The High Sierra Fly-In is the world's largest backcountry aviation gathering. For better or worse, it keeps getting bigger each year. This year, for safety reasons, attendance is going to be capped. Regista registration is now open and it is limited. Organizers say safety is their number one priority and unchecked growth in attendance could pose a threat. The event runs October 17th through the 20th on the Dead Cow Lake Bed north of Reno. Find more info and register at stoldrag.com. It's a night to honor the best in the biz. The Bob Hoover Trophy being presented this year to aviation legend Clay Lacey. The reception is next week at the historic terminal in Washington, D.C.'s Reagan National Airport. Look for more coverage next week on the program. There's a big opportunity for women who want to be professional pilots. L3 Commercial Aviation is announcing a series of scholarships to their airline academy in Sanford, Florida. Two women will get $25,000 towards their flight training and eight more will get $12,500. Find more information on their website. And speaking of flight training, ATP Flight School just got eight brand new Piper Archer TXs. They are part of a 100 unit deal that the two companies announced last year. These airplanes will go to train students in their Dallas locations for the Envoy Air Cadet program. During flight training, it's something you read about, but pilots rarely get a chance to experience it in person. That's low-level wind shear. AOPA pilot editor-at-large Dave Hirschman shows us a real-life example. Wind shear was almost guaranteed on this approach and landing. 
A fast moving cold front had pushed through New England 24 hours before we arrived over frigid Greenville, Maine in the Cessna 182 skyline. The wind there was blowing out of the northwest at 22 knots gusting to 33. That direction meant the wind would tumble over mountains before reaching the airport where uneven snowdrifts lining runway 32 made matters even worse. The videographer Josh Cochran was flying and he wisely added half the gust factor to the skyline's approach speed. But watch how quickly that cushion goes away during the landing flare. It disappears in an instant and the skyline's main wheels drop to the surface. Once on the ground, patterns of snow snaking across the airport made the concept of wind shear easy to see. Wind shear is a sudden shift in wind speed or direction, and it can be caused by frontal passage, thunderstorms, temperature inversions, or, as in this case, terrain features. Pilots are taught to counter wind shear by recognizing situations where it develops, increasing their approach speeds, and being spring-loaded to climb if it's encountered near the ground. Dave Hirschman, AOPA Live. Coming up after the break, a new model from TVN. And what the future of transportation looks like, according to Bell. We'll be right back. Thank you for being here to support Angel Fight West and the fifth annual Endeavor Awards. The real heroes in this equation are the Angel Flight passengers. Wow. See, I told you you'd love this. Welcome back. Dower has a new hot rod in its TBM 900 series of single engine turboprops. The company unveiling the TBM 940. The new model builds on the popular line. The 940 boasts an impressive time to climb. 18 minutes to climb to flight level 310. Some new technology as well, the model introducing auto throttle and auto engine protection. And a new record in a TBM, 8 hours and 37 minutes from New York to Paris. Pilots Phil Bozick and Dirk Reuter broke Chuck Yeager's 1985 record by nearly an hour. The pair set the time in a TBM 9.30. The Air Safety Institute has a new video in their Real Pilot series. Powerless Over Paris tells the story of a pilot flying a Cessna Cardinal over Texas who lost all electrical power in IMC at night. The pilot was ready to give up, but the air traffic controllers were determined to help. They looked up the pilot's cell phone number and texted him directions to an airport with better weather. You know, I, I'm a physician and uh, they're as devoted as a physician uh, to saving lives. And that's not, that's saying a lot that, someone that puts their interests above your own. Uh, they could have gone home, one guy stayed overtime. Uh, I mean, they were really there rooting for me and uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't just a job for them. They were really there trying uh, to pull me out of this. The biggest takeaway from the video is to put your cell phone number in your flight plan so that ATC can contact you if you lose your radio. You can find the full version on the Air Safety Institute website. I saw that uh, this week. It is very powerful, very much worth your time, and I really came away with some, some thoughts and, and I think some ideas on, in addition to putting the cell phone number in, the, in your flight plan, some other things about uh, emergency preparedness in the case of uh, power loss or you know, electrical power loss. And so it was a really thoughtful piece. Good. I well haven't done. seen it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. I remember when that happened, and it just yeah. seemed so amazing yeah, what well those air traffic controllers did. Yeah, well done. The White House just announced its $4.75 trillion budget, and what it leaves out is good news for GA. The budget does not include air traffic control privatization. The White House appears to have listened to the reasons why the so-called privatization proposal didn't solve the problems it was supposed to address. The budget does include funding to improve communication between con controllers and pilots. It also includes provisions for the Department of Transportation to keep pace with new technologies, like UAS, commercial space, and autonomous vehicles. And speaking of transportation of the future, last week at HAI Heli Expo, Bell showed off its new Nexus VTOL. AOPA technical editor Mike Collins was there. Urban air taxis were a little closer to takeoff at the Helicopter Association International's Heli Expo in Atlanta last week, 
but that doesn't mean aircraft are flying. EV tall aircraft, that's electric vertical takeoff and landing, were a hot topic. So was UAM, on-demand urban air mobility, summoned with an app like Uber or Lyft ride sharing today. And the technology that will enable it has made noticeable advances in the past year. It's clear these VTOL aircraft won't be all electric at first. The energy density of today's batteries just won't allow it. Honeywell has paired a turboshaft engine with a gearbox and two generators. It'll be certified in 2023 to 2025, which is when the company says the market will need it. French-based engine manufacturer Safran is also developing gas turbo generators, as well as electric motors, to power hybrid electric vehicles. Safran doesn't see full electric aerial travel until about 2040. A large-scale mock-up of Bell's Nexus hybrid electric VTOL aircraft drew lots of attention. The single-engine hybrid has distributed electric propulsion. Six large ducted fans pivot from horizontal orientation, providing vertical lift, to vertical providing a forward speed of up to 155 knots. In forward flight, those ducts provide both lift and thrust. Bell projects a gross weight of 6,000 pounds. The comfortable cabin is about the size of a minivan. The mock-up has a cockpit, but the end game is autonomous flight. Bell's APT for autonomous pod transport is in flight test today. This is an on-man cargo delivery system. The APT-70 shown here has a 70-pound payload. The aircraft itself weighs 300 to 325 pounds. The industry is also looking at heliports and infrastructure requirements, as well as ways to fund infrastructure and technology development. Mike Collins, AOPA Live. So it's certainly going to be interesting to see where this goes. Uh, the, obviously, the horizon lines are, are different. Uh, the horizons, uh, some people think it's going to be 2023 and what Saffron say in 2040. Uh, so uh, we'll see who's right. There's a lot of energy around this in Washington. There was a hearing this week yeah. that was supposed to be on the broader subject of just the future of aviation right. and this, the airspace system, but almost everybody, including AOPA, we submitted testimony for the record, yeah. talked about EV toll and autonomous flight. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's a big, big topic. It really is. Well, that's mm. it for our program this week. We thank you for being a part of it. And we welcome your thoughts, as always. Just drop us a note. The address, AOPA Live at AOPA.org. See you next time. Purchasing your own aircraft is an exciting experience. AOPA Finance simplifies the process, saving you money with lower interest rates and hassle-free loans, so you get into your new aircraft sooner. AOPA Finance, the right approach to buying an aircraft.